Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, Past, Present, and Future. Welcome, and here now, Corey Gomez. Hello everyone and welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, Past, Present, and Future. Today I am joined by a glow girl, an actress, a bounty hunter. You may know her as Tiffany Million, Tiffany Mellon. I know her as Sandra Margot and Tiffany Million, Tiffany Mellon. Um, thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, Corey. Now, uh, Glow, I know, was your, your first uh, big thing. I always ask, because you hear different stories uh, when it came to Glow. Did you know at the time you when you came in, I know a lot of the original girls were just going to an open casting call. Did you know you were going to a call for professional wrestling girls? Yes. Actually, how this started was I was living at the time in Orange County with um, these two girls who were lesbian lovers. I was their roommate. And the more butch one used to watch Glow all the time. And one time I came down from upstairs. I just woken up, went down to get my copy, and she said, Sandra, Sandra, you got to watch this. We're going to this great show. Look at all these hot girls. So I sat down with her, and I watched it, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And we watched it together, and that girl and I are still friends to this day, by the way. So um, shortly thereafter, I was at a casting agent in North Hollywood, California, called BJ's Casting. Yes, that's really the name. It's actually the initials of the guy that owned the agency. I know wow, it sounds funny. Okay. And so I was sitting at the desk looking at, you know, the things they could send me out on that day. And on the wall behind the casting agent was a sheet tacked to the tack board. And it said, casting for Glow the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. And I said to my casting agent, Michael, oh my gosh, I love that show. Send me out for that. And he turns around and he looks at it and he looks at me kind of funny. And he's like, you want to go out for that show? I said, yes, I love that show. It's crazy. I love crazy. You know me. He says, all right. So he put me on the list. And the funny thing was, right next to the casting sheet, there was a headshot tacked on the same board of this very handsome man, young man. And I said, by the way, who is that handsome man in that photograph on the tack board? He says, that's Johnny. He's going to be a big star someday. It was Johnny Depp. Oh. Well. So... <laughs> Johnny Depp and I were at one time with the same casting agency, and this is way back before he got 21 Jump Street, so we're talking a long time ago. But <laughs> The greatest actor in Hollywood, I've said that many times. Well, yeah, that's a whole other story, but <laughs> <laughs> moving on. <laughs> now, yeah, because I know some of the girls had seen the ad, because Glow used to run that ad at the bottom. Do you want to be a Glow girl? Call 1-800, you know, like that. So you actually did it all through a, uh, through your agent. Yes, I did it through my agent, who thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> how, how was the training for you? I mean, did you have any, like, previous, like, wrestling or martial arts or any kind of experience before you went into it? What's funny, Corey, is that I was so not athletic growing up. I was a bookworm. I was an artist. I was a wallflower when I was younger. I would go to school dances and hug the wall. You couldn't <laughs> peel me away from the wall. Um, and I hated P.E. I always got the worst grades in P.E. I couldn't stand it. So I was so not physical. The only thing that I did do was when I was in my... I guess I was about 18 or 19 when I started stripping. I decided that I wanted to start going to a gym and working out. So I did work out regularly, and I started working out because I went through a major depression when I was in my late teens, and I wanted something to pull me out of it. And I thought maybe if I worked out, it would help pull me out of this depressive rut that I was in. And it did. It pulled me out of it. So I became very religiously devoted to working out. So that was really the only thing that I did that was even remotely athletic because I hated any kind of sports. I was very much an artist and a bookworm <laughs> <laughs> and I did not like wrestling. I'd never watched wrestling in my life except for glow, which was pretty recent only because of my lesbian roommate that turned me on to it. And I didn't love the show because of the wrestling. I loved it because of the campiness and I love campy. I've always loved campy movies and, you know, campy comedies. And that's why I loved it. I love the campiness. Well, yeah, it was like, because uh, yeah, there was never any wrestling like that. I mean, it was it was like a sitcom with a laugh track that had skits yeah. and wrestling inserted. Yeah, it was, there was never anything like it. That's why I was so, I think like everyone, 
which, I mean, everybody, I think, kind of knows the story, but, you know, here you guys are on a tour, magazines, merchandise, everything, and then it closed. You know, I mean, it, were you surprised that all those years later they made a Netflix show of it? I was surprised, but, like, you know, everything is cyclical, and I guess the show is considered vintage now, and people have this, you know, thing for nostalgia. It's nostalgic, and the generation like yourself who grew up watching Glow are reaching that age where they're longing for nostalgia, connecting to their childhood, and I think that's why Glow has all of a sudden, you know, become popular again because that generation that was our fans are now grown up and have families of their own and they're getting to the age where they're wanting to reconnect with their childhood, kind of like for the same reason that middle-aged men buy sports cars, you know, it's it's just kind of that time in your life when you want to start reconnecting with um, your youth and that's the generation that watched us, that's the age they are now, so they're experiencing that midlife crisis and they're wanting to reconnect to their youth, so that's my that's my psychoanalysis of the why. <laughs> now, when, when you were there, now, you had to live then with all the other girls. You guys had like a like an apartment, dormitory, so to speak. You guys all had to live together with curfew and everything when you were there, correct? Yeah, nobody listened to the curfew. But, <laughs> yes, they, they rented some apartments um, in Los Angeles right next – I'm sorry, not Los Angeles, Las Vegas, right next to where – the uh, location where we were trained and we actually shot the show so that it was walking distance and they put us all and it, it was not a very nice apartment complex oh my gosh when, when we very first moved in there like the week after we moved in there was a murder in one of the apartments some guy attacked uh, a woman he was dating or something and stabbed her to death and when they, when the police, you know, taped off the crime scene, they had to leave it exactly the way that it was. And the window, the curtain had been like ripped open by the victim. So we were able to actually walk up to the window. And a lot of the girls will remember this, especially, I don't remember which of the girls actually saw it, but a lot of them will remember this. Um, you were able to walk up to the window of the apartment and look in the kitchen window and literally see blood and dishes flung all over and cabinets pulled open. I mean, it was a violent crime scene. And this happened probably a week or two after we all moved in there. So, they had us all in two-bedroom apartments, two girls per bedroom. So four girls in a two-bedroom apartment. And when we first moved in there, it was pretty random. Um, got to pretty much pick who we wanted to room with. And then as they started giving us our characters, assigning us our characters, they wanted complete separation, the good girls from the bad girls. So they had us all move apartments, and only the good girls could live with the good girls, and the bad girls could live with the bad girls because they wanted to um, keep up the illusion, you know, because they were very careful about that. When we were on tour or when we were in public, the good girls were not allowed to associate with the bad girls. Even though in real life we were best friends, we had to maintain the illusion at all times. I remember all of you guys, like, kind of fighting with each other when you were coming off the buses. That was intentional. We had to do that. We had to maintain the illusion. And it was we were able it, to do that. I always thought that was so corny because, like, I, I mean, for the simple fact that your show wasn't like an average WWF wrestling show. You know, it was it had a laugh track. You know, I mean, you had the yeah. I never why they why they why uh, I never understood why they went for that whole illusion of the of the good girls and the bad girls like that. I mean, well, I guess things were different back then, though. So. I think it's for the same reason that you don't want to tell your kids that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny aren't real until they get to a certain age. I think Glow understood that the majority of our audience were mostly younger guys, you know, younger kids, and they thought that it was important to maintain that illusion for them. So they didn't want our fans seeing us, these little kids, you know, seeing us going, well, wait a minute, on the show, they hate each other, and they're fighting each other, but I just saw the two of them, like, you know, sitting there eating with each other. So they were very careful about that, and we were told that when we were in public, we were to stand apart from each other, and there should be some visible animosity, you know. Now, when, when Glow came to an end... Did you have aspirations to try out for, like, the WWF or any of the other wrestling promotions? No. no, I was actually I was actually fired from GLOW in January or February of 19, I think 1990, and I got fired from Trump Castle in Atlantic City um, because I had figured out 
the financial scheme they were playing on all of us and I was alerting all the other girls as to what they were doing. There was a lot of financial fraud, tax fraud. Um, there was some scheming going on behind the scenes and I had, you know, I was a private investigator for many years and I kind of figured it out and I was alerting the other girls to it. Well, they didn't like that because I was on to them. So they um, knew they were going to fire me. So they waited until they got us out to Trump Castle where I got to um, interact with and meet our wonderful 45th president whom I love to the ends of the earth. I got to interact with him um, and observe him for the time that we were there, which as I recall, might have been like seven or 10 days. And I loved him ever since. I just, he so impressed me when I first met him, nothing at all like I thought he was going to be. And so, um, they, they knew they were going to fire me. And what they did was they took me all the way out to Atlantic City, City, let me work, went on the Phil Donahue show, did some other shows, did my show. And then one morning they had Johnny C take me to breakfast because Johnny C and I were very good friends, even though he ripped me off and to this day still owes me a bunch of money, a little shit. Um, <laughs> I remember the Donahue show. I think I have a VHS copy of it somewhere. Yeah, he actually, um, they had him fire me because they knew that he and I were friends. He took me out to breakfast and he told me at breakfast that they were letting me go and he gave me my um, letter that I still have to this day and my final paycheck and took Security took my suitcases, and because Nancy Daly, who plays Dementia and the Black Widow, was my then lover, because we were lesbian lovers, they fired her, too. Security took both of us outside of Trump Castle with our luggage, dumped us in front of the hotel with no plane ticket, and told us to find our way home to California. That's how they did me. Nowadays, you, you would have owned that, you would have owned that, the whole, that, that whole strip. Yes, exactly, but I didn't know any better back then, but that's why they fired me, because I was the smart one of the bunch, and I always have been like that. I have a very inquisitive mind. I was a private investigator for 25 years, licensed in several states, and I got fellow PIs right now are begging me to get back into the game. I don't know if I'm going to do it or not, but... Um, so that's what happened. I figured out what they were doing financially. I was starting to put two and two together and do a little poking around and figure out what they were up to, trying to tell the other girls. They knew that I was the one who was rousing the rabble and um, and dumped me in the middle of winter in the ice and snow with no plane ticket, both Nancy and I, and we had to find our way home. Do you guys, do you, did you keep in contact with her after that? No, Nancy to this day still won't talk to me. Talk about being a bitter person you know she and i split up uh we got back to la and i started doing b movies you know i went back to acting and nancy was working um she was i don't remember what she was doing after a while she went to work at safeway but um i got back to la and then i got hired to go to japan on a wrestling gig uh to open the new tokyo arena twenty five thousand people and it was matilda the hun medusa michelli uh beastie and myself uh, Tulsa was there. I'm trying to remember who else. And they flew us out to Japan. We had a great time. We um, we wrestled the Japanese girls at the Tokyo Arena where they do real wrestling, like cut themselves with razor blades so yeah. they can bleed. Man, uh, we had to train with them for a week before we did that, and that was really tough. So I did that, and while I was there, while I was in um, Tokyo, I met a guy, and I slept with them. And so when I got back to Los Angeles, because Nancy and I were still a couple, I confided to my talent agent, the same one that cast me in GLOW, this queer guy named Michael, um, confided in him. He was my friend that I'd had a little, you know, little rendezvous while I was in Tokyo. Well, he told Nancy, and Nancy um, came home and practically killed me, chased me around the apartment with a knife. So I... Um, you know, I packed up and I found a roommate and I moved out. We were living, it was Nancy and myself and Tulsa. We were roommates in Encino, California. And so um, to this day, um, Nancy is still bitter with me over that. You know, even though it's been, what, almost 30 years, you know, and I'm married and I have grandkids and I'm, you know, a completely different person. I reached out to her and I said, hey, how are you? doing you know i'm i you know you look great i hope you're doing well and she acted like it was still 1990 it was the craziest thing and i i messaged her back and i said i'm really sorry to see that you that you've become such a bitter person god bless you i you know i i wish you well <laughs> but she's still bitter um 
over that. And like I said, that was in, gosh, 1990. I mean, at least she didn't chase you with an axe or anything. You know, that would be really crazy, but... Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's uh, that, that's that's too bad. I would like to think that after thirty years, you can move on from just about anything. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really baffling to me. Like, I don't know, maybe because she's never had kids or never been married. I'm not sure, but that's an awfully long time to hold a grudge, you know. Now, when Glow ended, then is that when you went on to do you did the B movies? How did you get into the adult films? Um. Well, let me back up a little bit here and think, how do I tell this story? So, after after I moved out from Nancy, moved out from that apartment that I had with Nancy in Tulsa, uh, Jody Hazelbarth, I moved in with um, a roommate that I'd met through the newspaper that had a room for rent that ended up ended up not working out very well and so some friends of mine from san francisco because that's where i'm originally from some lesbian friends of mine had moved to the san fernando valley and were renting a home in granada hills and um said that they had an extra room in the house would i like to rent it so i moved in with them and these were again these were girls that i knew from san francisco because that's where i originally came from when i first uh, moved to los angeles to get into acting and um I was to support myself in between doing acting in B movies and small television parts. I had started doing um, mud wrestling, and that's where I originally met Matilda the Hun because we were both working for um, oh gosh that famous place in L.A. where they do the mud wrestling. The um, she was she was working there doing mud wrestling. Yeah, it's a real famous place, and I'm like it's. Oh, goodness gracious, it'll come to me in a second. So, Matilda the Hun was doing the mud wrestling shows at this place um, in L.A., and I was doing their traveling shows. Um, and that's a whole story how I got into that. It, it involved a car accident that involved Todd Bridges' father. The story gets crazy, I'm telling you. Was it the Tropicana? <laughs> yes, yes, the Tropicana. Thank you. So, I was, when I, when I left Glow... I went back to doing B-movie parts, and that's what I was doing mainly for a living, and I was doing some stripping on the side to, you know, supplement my income. And I was on my way to an, um, another casting agent's office to get more parts, and the casting agency was owned by Todd Bridges' father, Todd Bridges from Different Strokes. Mm -hmm. It was owned by his father, and on my way to his office, I got into a car accident on Sunset Boulevard. I rear-ended a car. And I was really worried because I didn't have insurance and how was I going to fix my car. The, the guy that I hit, I only did a couple hundred dollars damage. It was a Mercedes, so it damaged my Honda more than his Mercedes. <laughs> I didn't have the money to fix my car, and I was calling around to some people I knew. And I called um, Matilda because she and I had stayed in touch because we had just gone to Japan together. And I said, hey, you know, I'm looking for a way to make some quick money. Are there any wrestling gigs coming up or anything? I just, you know, rear-ended this guy on Sunset Boulevard, and I never made it to see Todd Bridges' dad. And she says, well, I know this guy named um, Gary, and he runs the mud wrestling um, shows at the Tropicana, but he's looking for some girls to do their traveling shows, like outside the Tropicana, give him a call. So I called Gary, and um, he said, oh, yeah, my guy that works for me, up in Bakersfield at a club up there needs some girls immediately. You can go up there and make some money. Here's his phone number. His name is Kevin. And so I called this guy Kevin, and I drove up to Bakersfield and to do um, a med wrestling show there, and it was love at first sight. He was the father of my first child. Hmm. Yeah, it was love at first Now, um, right now, I wouldn't give you two cents for him. He turned out oh. to be a real... <laughs> turned out to be a real dirt, but um, he did father my first daughter, who's now... Um, She's 30 years old and has four, my four grandsons. She's a wonderful daughter. Um, so that's, I mean, where was I going with this? You know, when you get to be 54 and you're tired and you've been doing nothing but digital soldiering for nine months, you tend to forget <laughs> stuff. So you asked me a question. I was trying to answer the question. Remind me. How you got into the adult film business? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So when Kevin and I, Kevin and I ended up buying a place together and I moved to Bakersfield with him and I got pregnant with my daughter. While I was pregnant with my daughter, he got a job. Well, I got him a job at uh, Deja Vu, the Deja Vu Club in Bakersfield because we stopped working for Gary. Gary ripped us off. That was a whole ugly thing. So we had bills to pay and 
I found this ad in the newspaper. They were looking for a DJ at the local Deja Vu Club, and Kevin can do that. That's a lot what he did when we did the uh, mud wrestling shows. So I got him a job there at Deja Vu. Well, Deja Vu had an attached adult film shop. So, like, it was one half was um, the strip club and the bar, and the other half was an adult an adult movie, like, rental place. So he started bringing home adult films for us to watch, you know, have our little Friday night thing where we'd light a fire and watch a movie and, you know, do our thing. And so I would watch these movies with him, you know, we have our little nights, and I'd say, man, I just, I don't understand if you're going to be in these movies and you're going to show your body, why wouldn't you take care of your body? Like, I'd watch these girls and they just, they were all jiggly and cellulite and... <laughs> Hey, there's, a, there's a market for that now. Come on. Yeah, but, you know, back then, and then their acting skills were shit. So I was like, so I used to always brag. I'd say, man, if I was ever in those movies, you know, I would probably do really well because um, I have some acting chops. Um, I have a name from Glow, and I work out religiously. Like, I, my body was very toned. So when he and I split up, and I moved back to Los Angeles from Bakersfield, I thought, well, heck, nothing's stopping me. Maybe I should do that, you know, because I was still, I was working at the Mitchell Brothers O'Farrell Theater in San Francisco, the world famous Mitchell Brothers that they made the movie about with Charlie Sheen. Yes, behind the green door, guys. Yes, I worked there for many years. I knew both Art and Jimmy Mitchell, and um, I can't believe that Jimmy killed Artie. We would have thought it would have been the other way around because Artie was the crazy one and spent a lot of time with Artie. But, um, I had gone back to working there, just driving up on the weekends, working three days, and then coming home for four or five days. Um, but I, you know, with my young daughter, I didn't like leaving her at the babysitters all the time, so I was like, I gotta do something else. I can't keep going up to San Francisco, and I thought, well, maybe I should take it seriously and get into adult films. So I just started calling some people I knew in the, you know, in the business, in the stripping business, asking them if they knew anybody in the adult film industry. And they introduced me to an agent by the name of Reb. And I went and um, met with Reb and took some pictures, and I started getting bookings immediately. And from from the first moment that I started doing films, because back then they used to have real scripts, you know, where you actually had to know how to act. It wasn't like these days. Um, this was the old days where they, yeah, they shot on plots. film. Shot on film with a plot. Yes, with a production value and real sets and real crews and, you know, just like a real movie, just scaled down. So from the first couple of movies I did, word got around very quickly because I was not a drug addict. I was not a drunk. I showed up on time. I was professional. I was friendly because I, I was a, an actress. You know, I, you know, I wasn't I wasn't a drug whore trying to get her next fix. I was actually a professional actress who could do that in front of a camera with no inhibitions whatsoever so my reputation my profile went up pretty quickly in the industry just because of the fact that i was all those things you know that i was professional and and kind and wasn't a bitch and didn't drink and didn't do drugs and knew my lines and you know all that stuff so um and then after i was in the business for about a year and a half i decided that just being an actress was not enough for me that i had to also produce the movies which i knew nothing about but I figured um, everybody loves to show you what they know. So I just started calling up people I knew in the business who were directors, producers, camera guys, music guys, script writers, and said, hey, I'm thinking about making, producing one of my own movies. Can I take you out to lunch and pick your brain? Well, everybody loves to show you what they know. So that's how I did it. I just started um, taking all these guys in the business out to lunch and bring a notebook and making notes and asking questions. And they were more than happy to share what they knew. And I put together a plan and got an investor and made my first movie. And after that, I made seven or eight more and sold a bunch of them to the Playboy channel. Now the producing is where you can make the real money in that, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, mm. The problem though with the adult film industry is you get really ripped off in the distribution. Um, because let's say like I had a distributor, this Russian guy, he was super cool to me. His name was Alex Katz, K-A-T-Z. And he owned, um, trying to think of the name of the company that he owned. Oh gosh, it'll come to me. The name of my company was Immaculate Video Conceptions. And that came from my Catholic school days. So I decided to, um, sorry, mom, I know you spent all that money sending me to Catholic school, but I was like, well, I'm going to get something out of 13 years of Catholic education, so I named a porn company Immaculate Video Conceptions. There you go. 
you know, I'm sorry, God, you know, I love you, but I'm so not, I, I'm a Christian, not a Catholic, they're devils. Um, so yeah, the problem, the problem with adult films back then is if you went to your distributor and you ordered, let's say you ordered 5,000 copies of the movie, what they would do is they would run off an extra thousand or two without you knowing, and then they would sell them out of the trunk of their car. Mm. So it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very dirty, nasty business in more ways than one, no pun intended. The funny thing is, is that the majority of the people that work in the business, um, the crew, the makeup artists, the lighting guys, um, the grips, the camera guys, they're all super nice people. They could not, you can have your cooch right in their face and they're yawning. They've seen everything. They don't care. They're just like they just want to work and go home mm -hmm. they're very normal people um it's uh it's the distributors who are the real slime balls and a lot of the talent boy i got stories about the talent ron jeremy <laughs> he and i go back many many years and i'm very um i talked to him two weeks before he was arrested and you know we've stayed in contact all the years i, I put it this way but Ron Jeremy is being accused of, I don't believe it for a second. I think he was set up. I think there's another story because I do not believe for a second that Ron Jeremy would rape anybody. He is, he doesn't have an aggressive bone in his body. I, and he and I were very close. I mean, he's, he's been to my house for Thanksgiving. I've got videotapes of him at my house on Thanksgiving telling jokes at my table that had never been seen before by the public because they're stuck on a VHS tape. But I've gone on trips with him. I've gone on to conventions with him. We've gone out to eat. I've gone to events with him. He's always been nothing but a perfect gentleman. And I just, um, I really don't believe, I know you know that you probably, and your listeners probably know that he was arrested a few months ago, supposedly for rape. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, mean, I think we all found it odd. It's like, here's a guy who gets paid to have sex for a living. What's he doing raping people? You know what I mean? Kind no, of, not to make light of it, but it was just kind of like, that was one of the odder arrests of the, of the year. So yeah. And anybody who's known Ron for a long time will tell you the same story, because I've talked to a few other people. Um, he just... So he's a former um, U.S. history teacher. He was a he was a teacher when he was younger. He was roommates with Sam Kinison. Sam he got Sam Kinison his start in comedy. They were roommates. Um, and yeah, that whole thing is very troubling. Like I said, I spoke to him two weeks before he was arrested. I had no idea this was going to happen, and it's very very troubling because I really like the guy. He's highly intelligent, um, very funny. And I know him very well. I just, I'm sorry. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I would have seen, I would have seen that side of him in the, in the decades that I knew him very well and hung out and still to this day do never seen an inkling of that whatsoever. Now, is he in, is he incarcerated now or is he like s still pending? It's still pending. He's in County. Cause he's been pending for a long time now. You think they would have moved things along by now. Yeah, you would think so. I know. I feel really bad for him. I really do. Or at least let him have bonded out by now. I mean, clearly he's not a flight risk. I'm just, I'm not buying the story. And so that's how, that's how I got into it. Um, I did it for four years. But the funny thing about the porn industry is movies featuring my name and my likeness are still coming out to this day because what they do is they chop up old movies and insert old scenes into new movies as filler material. So when I tell people that the last time I'm in a movie was in 19, let me think, it was in 1995 was the last time I made a movie. It was with Raquel Darian. And actually, I didn't actually make that movie that year. It was a pickup scene for a movie I did the year before. They had the footage got lost or got damaged, and they had to have me come in and reshoot, um, reshoot a dialogue scene with Raquel Darian to save the movie. And so I did, and that was the last thing I did. So here it's been oh, 25 years, and new movies featuring my likeness and my name are still coming out to this day, and there's not a damn thing I can do about it. Yeah, I've talked to a handful of actors from the, the straight-to-video days of the 90s, like the action films, and they're like, they would take all the footage that was cut out and they'd splice it together, and the next thing you know, they're releasing a, a, a part two or, a, or another title of a film that... I had nothing to do with. So, you know, it was, right. it was weird how that worked back then. 
Yeah, and there's no royalties or commissions or anything. You're just paid for the day. The big money in adult movies is not from the movies themselves. It's marketing your name. So it's going and, and headlining at adult clubs around the country as a feature and your fan club. And, of course, these days the girls would have, you know, websites and everything else. But back then we made our money by um, selling autographed pictures, chips, um, you know, selling Polaroids, selling movies, uh, you know, all that fan club stuff. And that's where the big money was. Making the movies was not the big money whatsoever. What made you get out of the business? My father passed away. And then when... I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. My father passed away in September of 1994, and it really changed me. It really caused me to really rethink my life. And um, he, I, you know, I got half of his estate... And so that afforded me a few years where I could really think about what I wanted to do. It, you know, I miss my dad so much, but he did give me the ability to leave the adult film business and just kind of really take some of my life. And um, so that's what I did. I took a few years off and just stayed home with my daughter, which I was home with her all the time. Anyhow, I mean, the, the reason that I even got into the films to begin with is because I didn't want my daughter with babysitters. And that's what I mentioned to you earlier. I didn't, I didn't. I wasn't comfortable with my daughter being with babysitters all the time because I was sexually abused when I was in the care of a babysitter when I was younger, and it always bothered me. So um, working in adult films, you know, you could work one day every two weeks and make enough money to where you could stay home all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I was able, I made enough money where I was able to hire a live-in nanny, and so my daughter was home all the time, and that made me feel better i did not like the idea of her being at child care it's because i was sexually abused in child care so um so that was my main motivation was my daughter it was taking care of her and making sure she was safe so once i uh once my father passed away and he left me his estate i was able to take a few years off and then um i got into radio and i did radio for about four years um all over the country. I've been to every state except for Alaska over and over and over and over again between glow and traveling for the porn biz and then radio. I mean, I was in a new city, like every day I was in a new city. Um, so I did radio. I wrote a few books. I have, I think three books out there right now. I have a comic book. Um, and then I got pregnant with my second daughter. Now let me, and, what, what, what are the, the books for people that want to buy them? Well, I don't know if they're even in print anymore. Um, I know that Carnal Comics, so I was featured. There was a line of comic books called Carnal Comics, and every episode of every issue of Carnal Comics featured a different porn star. So I was featured in one of those, and I have a stack of them here in my fall cabinet somewhere. I'll auction them off one day. I have, like, ten of them. And then um, I was I was in a few other books. Gosh, I can't even remember. There was a lot of people that wrote books. I was doing the talk show circuit at that time. Um I did, gosh, dozens of talk shows. I mean, Geraldo Rivera knows me by name, and Jerry Springer knows me, and, you know, I've done tons of talk shows. Um, I did Wendy Williams' show back when she was still on radio and wasn't on TV yet. So, I mean, I made my rounds. Um, after I left the porn biz, that's kind of the other thing that I did besides radio is, and, and while I was in the biz, too, so... These talk shows would call the agencies. There were two main porn agencies. There was Jim South at World Modeling Agency, which was the big one. And then there was Reb's agency, which was called Pretty Girl International. And those two pretty much covered all the talent in the industry. Um, Reb and I had a falling out, so I ended up going over to World Modeling, Jim South. And so Jim's office would get calls all the time for porn stars to appear on talk shows. And um, I... It was either me or Nina Hartley that used to get all of the talk shows because we were the only two girls in the business who were articulate, who weren't druggies, who could handle all the, you know, all, all the stuff being thrown at us and come back with smart answers and, you know, just could handle a crowd. So Nina wasn't available as often as I was. She had her own thing she was doing. So I got most of the talk shows. So anytime a call would come in to World Modeling Agency, hey, we want a girl from the, you know, the industry on a talk show, Jim would always say, call Tiffany because she represents the industry really well. So I would go on there and, and I, I have stacks of tapes of myself on talk shows like many years you were in the documentary after porn ends weren't you yes i was i'm gonna tell Still you friends. i, I saw that and i didn't like it that made porn out to be such a 
dirty, depressing uh, business. It was not a docu. Some documentaries they make kind of almost seedy and depressing on purpose. Uh, uh, no offense if you if you like that. I was I was not a fan of that one. Well, it's it was very truthful though. Oh, that makes it, it was sad. <laughs> Yeah, well, the guy that produced that, his name is Bryce Wagner. He and I are still friends to this day, and we actually have our own movie project going right now. Um, the, we've been shopping around, and then this whole scandemic thing hit, and it shut it down. But um, he and I are actually co-owners of a script called The First Lady of Hell. That, um, And that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. So Sonny Barger from the Hells Angels, his ex-wife, Noelle, I've known her since she was 14 years old. And... Um, she gave me exclusive rights to her story, so I own her story. And so I took it to have a script made out of it with Bryce Wagner, who made um, After Porn Ends, and I'm business partners with him. But that, uh, that documentary is very accurate, and I'm the only one, if you watch it, the only success story out of all those people. And that's what Bryce told me. He said that out of all the... Uh, out of all the former porn talent that he interviewed, I'm the only one that actually survived it and went on to live, you know, a normal life. He said, unfortunately, he didn't. You know, their stories are sad. My story ended well. My stories did not. But um, I know that I know that my story is definitely the exception and not the rule to be able to move on and be married and have kids and live a relatively normal life after having been through all that. And I'm grateful to God for that. Have you ever, did you ever, when you first got out, did you ever like miss, I know this is a weird question, but did you ever like miss it or, uh, you know, miss the environment or anything like that? Or when you were done, were you just done? Well, there's some things I miss about it. I mean, I, I miss, I miss being on the set. I miss acting. And here's the funny thing about porn stars. So normal people, when they rent a porn film or back in the days when they used to rent them, you know, I'm dating myself here. They fast forward through the acting parts to watch the sex scenes we do the opposite we fast forward through the sex scenes to watch ourselves act <laughs> you know the ones the ones that i have seen i always had to watch the one i did not care if the guy got his tattoo or his pizza i had to, i wanted to see you know like that my my like i guess my grandfather was a huge collector and he would show me the, the john holmes ones the johnny wad ones and I didn't mind that because he's on a, he's the detective, he's on the case. You know, I, I got half a movie, half a half a sex show where when my friend had got one, it was a Jenna Jameson one, he wanted me to watch. I mean, the guy came in and was just like, I'm here for a tattoo. And she's like, let me give you your tattoo. And they fucked for like 20 something minutes. And then the next guy comes in, he's like, I need a tattoo on my back. And this, it's like, this is garbage. I can't watch this. This is this isn't even a green screen. They're doing it by a black tarp. I mean, I could have done that in my garage. Yeah, those were some of the more low-end movies. The ones that, that I was in were always the higher end. I mean, I started in some of the biggest films of the 1990s, mainly the Michael Ninn movies. Um, Michael Ninn made the most famous, most high-production value films of the 90s, and he started a whole trend in the industry, and he's still doing it to this day. I starred in um, Sex Part 1 and 2 with Sunset Thomas, and um, some other, some of the biggest movies. What were his other ones? Latex and Shock. So Shock, Shock and Latex were um, part one and part two, and then Sex Part One and Two. So they were the biggest films of the 1990s, and I starred in all four of them. And Michael Ninn, from the moment he met me, said, "Tiffany Milling, you will be in every single movie I ever produce." He wanted to star me in every movie he did, but then I left the business. Um, but um, yeah, the movies that I did weren't like that. They were. If you go, if you ever go back, a lot of my movies aren't available anymore, and I've sealed a lot of them in cans of bacon grease and thrown them in the trash. But um, I do have a few. Of them. <laughs> I have one. I think I have two left. One I have is called Ecstasy, and I say that one because it's a very professionally done film. It's very well done, and I did some of my best acting in it, so I still have that one. And then I have the Master of a movie that I wrote, directed, and produced called Generally Horny Hospital. <laughs> nice. The titles are sometimes the best parts of these things. I'm sorry. Well, you know what? When I first started producing movies, I wanted to do something that had never been done before, and I was told that everybody had tried to do it and nobody had done it, and I should just give it up. I wanted to combine that campy humor from my glow days with porn. 
And so do you like slapstick comedy, you know, but porn version and nobody had been able to do it successfully. Well, guess what? I did it and they were all big successes. I did. Um, I wrote, directed and produced a movie called Jailhouse Cock. I did um, Generally Horny Hospital. I did the XXX Files slash Lust in Space. Nice. And uh, they all came out really. I mean, they were great. They were very great. I got awards for every single one. And I was... Um, I collaborated on those with my partner, who is now deceased, but my best friend at the time, who was a porn director, his name was, um, his real name was Felix Bosa, but he went by a French name, I can't remember his name, anyhow, he ended up becoming my best friend, we were buddies, and we collaborated on everything, and I'll tell you what, those, those scripts were genius, <laughs> they were <laughs> genius, they were really funny. <laughs> now, when, when you, when you left that, you became... Catch me if I'm wrong, because you had a reality show. You became a bounty hunter. Yes, I became a bounty hunter. So after my, so I, I got pregnant with my second daughter in, um, around New Year's Eve of 1999. She was born in September of 2000. And um, for a couple of years there, I had a, a live cam site running from my home. So I had, I was one of the first girls to do that. I had a live camera, even in my shower. I had one in my kitchen, one in my shower, one in my office, one in my bedroom, where people could join my website and watch me 24 hours a day in my actual apartment. And so, and then they could interact with me. I'd have chat times during the day. And I, that's how I made my living for a couple of years in between doing radio and all this other stuff. So after my youngest daughter was born, I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. I needed to move in a different direction. I have two kids now. Keeping one kid off the cameras was, you know, easy because she was older. She was gone all the time. I could turn the cameras away or off when she was home. But now with the little baby at home, I was like, no, no, no. I this is time to move on. Mm -hmm. So I shut down the live cam site trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I told you that my oldest daughter's father was a real piece of crap. So at that time... I had been developing the skills of a private, because he, he wouldn't pay child support. He was work, working for cash under the table, avoiding me. He was just a total piece of crap. But ever since I left him in 1991, up until this time, this whole time I was in porn and everything, I was tracking him and his assets down. And this is before the Internet, so I was doing it the old-fashioned way. Um, with disguises and sending people in with hidden cameras in their clothes and with binoculars. I mean, I was <laughs> tracking him down. And it took me about um, 10 years, but I finally got him in court, got him in a corner in Los Angeles. He owed me $80,000 in back child support, and I made him a, a deal. I said, since you never see your daughter anyhow, because you haven't seen her since she was a baby, just sign away your rights, and I will forgive all child support, past, present, and future, because I had met my current husband, um, and I wanted him to adopt her. So he did. He signed off his rights. I, he was forgiven of all of his past you know, child support obligations, and my husband adopted my oldest daughter. So I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life, and my, my dad, who's a retired cop and FBI agent, said, well, you know, you've developed some amazing private investigation skills. You should consider making a career out of that. And I was like, yeah, I had become good at it. Huh? So I went to PI school, I got licensed, and I started working as a private investigator, and it was um, at a conference, so the guy that owned the PI school that I went to was also a bail bond agent, and he was giving a conference on how to become a bail bond agent, and he invited me to go. So when I went to the conference, and I started to sit down, sitting behind me at the conference was this big Mexican gang bang tatted up looking earring shaved head <laughs> tough mofo and uh, I turn around to him and uh, he, you know he looked like he's ready to kill somebody I'm not afraid of anybody I turn around and go you look like you have an interesting story what's your name he goes Loro I go Loro I like that I go talk to me Loro what do you do He's like, I'm a bounty hunter. I go, really? You're a bounty hunter? That's fascinating. So I pull up, and he can't believe this little, this little pretty little, you know, model-looking white girl is talking to him with no fear, because you know, I don't got any fear of anybody. So um, I'm talking to this guy, and I said, how do I do that? He goes, well, I could give you my boss's number. You know, maybe he's looking, you know, for some new people or something, and you being a female and everything, that's pretty unusual. He's like, he's talking in his gang talk, and he's like, you know, we don't have anybody in the business that looks like you. You know, if you could do it, you'd be really good because nobody would ever suspect you. So I called his boss. That was Zeke Unger at, um, it's, it was called a uh, World Executive Protection Agency. And I called him 
and I told him who I was. I didn't tell him I was a former porn star. I just told him that, um, I said, listen, I, I want to talk to you about coming to work for you. I'm a private investigator, but I said, you know, I'd make a really great bounty hunter because first of all, I own a gun. I don't know how to use it. <laughs> um, and second of all, nobody would ever suspect me because I look like an actress. And yes. he goes, interesting. Come with me. So, and at the time, he was working as a consultant on a bounty hunter movie at the time. And it came out, I can't remember the name of some big bounty hunter movie that came out. Is it Domino? I was actually the consultant on Domino. He was the consultant on the one before that, but I was actually a consultant on Domino. Um, so he asked me to come and talk to him. I went and met him, and he's like, you know what? He goes, I think we could really use you. You're right. He goes, nobody would ever suspect you. So they trained me, and from the moment that he hired me, I was able to break cases that they had had sitting in the office forever that they were unable to break because their guys look like bounty hunters, and the one woman they had looked like a man. <laughs> <laughs> so they were able to send me into places that nobody else could get into, and I broke a lot of cases for him, and he took me aside and wanted to talk to me about um, being an executive protection agent where you... Um, you know, like with celebrities and stuff where you like you walk around with them and you act like you're like their friend out shopping with them, but you're really their agent protecting them. So yeah. he was just about to start training me for executive protection when his partner, who was a female and she was a former L.A. County sheriff, found out that I used to be a porn star and fired me. Mm. And so that really that really upset me because he could have stood up for me, but he didn't. And he said it's because she owned fifty one percent of the company. He only owned forty nine percent. I'm like bullshit, Zeke. You know, fuck, fuck your shit. Sorry about my language. I no, never. You're fine. That. That's what I said at the time. Okay, that was me at the time. I don't. I don't use profanity anymore. I but, do. Um, <laughs> yeah, my God wouldn't appreciate that. You know, I'm supposed to represent my God, and and I don't. He's watching me, and I don't think I should be talking like that. So, um, so um, 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 um so he fired me, and um, right around that time, the producers for Domino got a hold of me. I did. I went to the premiere of the movie and everything. I got to walk the red carpet. There's pictures of me on the red carpet in front of the Chinese theater. That's where we had the premiere. So I was a consultant on that, and because the real Domino had gotten killed. Um, so then, um, and then after that, um, I. I was doing uh, bounty hunting for other um, kind of, you know, side work for other companies. And then Hollywood found out uh, found out that this former porn star was a bounty hunter. And I, I got contacted by a magazine. I'm, I think it was Marie Claire. They did a big spread on me. And then when that magazine came out, I started getting calls flying at me from production companies wanting to talk to me about doing a reality show that just launched me right there and i ended up doing a, a thing on 60 minutes 60 minutes did a thing on me they saw the magazine article they got a hold of me and then once the 60 minutes piece came out man i was getting hit with offers of reality shows everywhere it was crazy and so i ended up um going with world of wonder a production company out of hollywood and they sold the show to the we channel and um and the rest is history and so the show was 100 percent real it was absolute really reality we only had to recreate a few scenes because the camera crew couldn't be there with me 24 hours a day but the scenes that we recreated were not the actual hook them up scenes it was more the filler scenes like me making phone calls and stuff but there was only a few but everybody always asked me was your show real unlike dogs i'm like oh no no it was 100 percent real i had that camera crew embedded with me in my house they were in my car they were in my office yes it was 100 percent real <laughs> and I, was, I was gonna ironically i was gonna ask you um because i always thought dog the bounty hunter shit was fake and and i actually questioned if dog the bounty hunter is a real bounty hunter but um what what did you think of that did you think his show was all bullshit um, I, no, I think, I think that, um, you know, I know dog and he used to call me all the time. Every time he and Beth would have a fight and ask me if I was still married to my husband and he wanted to do a TV show with me at one point. Um, but Beth would always like send me nasty text messages telling me stay away from my man. And I would text her back and I'd say, don't flatter yourself. I wouldn't date your husband if he was the last man on earth. <laughs> is he a real bounty? I guess I'm going to ask, is he a real he bounty is. hunter? He is a real bounty hunter. We all know him in the industry. Back when I was working for Zeke, um, back before he, you know, we first started his TV show, he would call our office. We called him El Perro, was his nickname, which is the dog in Spanish. You know, like the phone would ring, and we'd say, Zeke El Perro's on the phone. That was the dog. 
Well, and the reason I asked is because I knew he was a he did time in a federal pen. He can't carry a gun. Yeah, I that's right. I didn't know if that would stop you from actually being. Because when I read that, I was like, well, then how can he be a licensed bounty hunter? That always, oh, always yeah. just kind of that always struck me as, as strange. Because the laws in every state are different. That's why he's a bounty hunter in Colorado and Hawaii, because they don't have any, at the time, they didn't have any laws for bounty hunters. Anybody could be a bounty hunter. There oh, was okay. no, yeah, that's why. And it's funny because people would ask him at the time about why he doesn't carry a gun, and he would say, I don't believe in guns and everything. I called him out one time. He and I were emailing each other. And I was like, why don't you just tell people the truth? I said, the reason you can't carry a gun is because you're a convicted felon, and nobody with a gun can be within a thousand feet of you. Yeah, that's, uh... <laughs> Like, why don't you tell the freaking truth, Dwayne? Now, I watched the other reality um, show on um, HBO. Did it? Um, it was called Family, Family Bonds. Bonds. Yeah, Evangelist. I think that. I, now, I liked that one. Now, that so dog. That's the reality show he wanted to do. So he had this idea. He wanted to do kind of like a competition bounty hunter show where it would be his team, my team, and family bonds. And at the beginning of the show, they would give us a case. They would give us all three the same case, and like kind of like a scavenger hunt. The first team to arrest the person was the winner. Right. So it'd be all three of our shows, which I thought was a great idea. I thought it's a really great idea, and um. And Beth said no because she was jealous of me because she knew that every time they would fight, he would call me and flirt with me. <laughs> Beth had a, a – I remember the uh, Beth's gigantic chest. That's about what I remember of her. Yeah. Um, then I remember she had an ungodly amount of, like, surgeries, and then she didn't even look the same. Yeah. I never met her in she, person. Unfortunately, then she passed away, I do believe, a few years ago, I read. Yeah, cancer. I have nothing bad to say about her. I've never met her. I just know that she used to send me these nasty emails and text messages when she found out that Dwayne would call me, and I would say, hey, don't flatter yourself. I'm like, I, I wouldn't date your husband if he was the last man on earth. It, there is no problem here. My husband is 12 years younger than me. He looks like a model. He's, he's my best friend. He doesn't watch sports. He doesn't drink. He doesn't do drugs. He's hardworking. He's honest. He's faithful. He's lovable. He loves my cats. He adopted my daughter. Trust me. I got gold. I know what I got. I don't need your man. <laughs> you <laughs> now, did you know the evangelists? Never met them. Uh, their show always seemed the more real of the of those two. Yeah. Um, but well, I did you say there, inside- there was the big trend for the bounty hunter shows there for a while. People inside of Dog Show told me that um, a lot of his cases, what he would do is he would make a deal with the person on bond. And pretty much tell them to hide and kind of like a setup, we're coming to get you. So Mm -hmm. that's what I was told. Now, whether or not there's any truth to that or whether it was some of them, I don't know. Um, It seemed that way to me just because of knowing the business. And then Zeke, my old boss, had his own show for a while. It was... uh, it was L.A. Bounty Hunters or something. It only ran for one season. It was, But it wasn't very successful because they didn't incorporate the human element into the show. The show just showed them out arresting people. Like, they didn't take the time to develop. If for any show to be successful like that, you can't just show the rough t- stuff. You got The audience has to like the characters. You mm-hmm. have to develop a bond with the characters, and that's where the producers of that show or the director of the show really fail. That's a big mistake that I saw. Um, they wanted to resurrect my show a couple of years ago, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm past that. I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm not the same person anymore. So, so you would not, you wouldn't want to get back into bounty hunting? No, no. I actually closed my bell bonds business. It'll be three years this January. Um, even though I was making amazing money, I just, after I got saved, after I accepted Jesus as my savior, I became very, very sensitive to negative energy and, um, I think, you know, they say that when you get saved, you get spiritual gifts. And I think for me, my spiritual gift was discernment and I'm able to see evil. And I was, I was starting to see things that I didn't see before I got saved and evil started really bothering me. And I interact, you know, a lot of my clients were uh, Mexican mafia and hell's angels and American, you know, Aryan brotherhood. And we had clients that had chopped people up and buried them in the desert and raped little kids. And I just, I just, couldn't do it anymore. It was really bothering me emotionally. And I gave up, you know, five figures a month in cash. Um, and I ended up waiting about six months and I took a job as a school bus driver just to be around kids. Cause I love kids. And I went from making, you know, a lot of money to making about $900 a month driving a school bus, which I loved happiest times of my life. 
and all the kids on my bus knew I was a former porn star. They loved me. <laughs> Thank I you. Was- in uh, 93, 94, when, when the show Renegade was on with Lorenzo Lamas, I, I had long hair. I used to tell girls I was a bounty hunter like him. So, you know, that uh, <laughs> that worked for me. That was the closest. I always thought bounty hunting, although dangerous, would be a pretty interesting profession. It's it's 1% excitement and 99% sitting around staring at a house waiting for something to happen. <laughs> it mostly just pisses you off because you just wish these people would go to court. And the funny thing is, after we finished shooting the TV show was when all the good stuff happened. Like <laughs> we got into some, uh, we got into some really hairy situations. I really wish that they would have been shooting the show the year after we shot it, because there was one situation where we arrested this guy. We've been after him forever. It was crazy. And we got into a situation where we got surrounded by literally a hundred people ready to kill us. They had to call out the birds, the entire police force, taser guns were involved. I mean, it was nuts. Um, yeah, yeah, it was just crazy. All the crazy stuff happened after we shot the, the TV show. And I was, every time we'd be out on a case, I'd say, man, why couldn't the camera crew have been here now? This is some great stuff. Now, my husband, my husband's a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he had to put a few people to sleep and bust down some doors and break windows. I mean, the stuff that people want to see. And this happened after we finished shooting the show. <laughs> now, is your show, can you get it? Uh, is, is it stream? Can you get it on disc? Or? You know, they're really insane that they don't stream it. They ran it again in 2010 after the original airing, and they haven't aired it since. I have it on DVD, and... Um, as soon as I can find somebody to make digital clips for me, I'm going to put it on my Patreon channel. But um, I just I don't know how to do that. I'm not very technical, so I'm just waiting for someone to be able to do it for me, and then I'll upload it to my Patreon channel along with all my other stuff that I have. Now, I was going to ask you for all your fans, um, are you active on social media? I know you have a website, I know. Yeah. No, I don't have a website. All I have is a Patreon and a Twitter. So I'm only on Twitter. And I used to be on Facebook. I got off of there. I'm not on Facebook anymore. Oh, that's Uh, why you didn't accept my friend request. Now I don't feel so bad. Oh, yeah. No, I haven't been on there in years. No, my page is still up. And I just need to go lasso all my old photos. Now I'm going to take it down. You are on Twitter. Did I find you on Twitter? No, I found you through another. I found you through uh, Jeannie. Um, What is your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is at and then Mrs. Escott sixty six. So M R S E S C O T T six six. So Mrs. E Scott six six. And then um my my nickname on Twitter is the Hollywood Defector. The Hollywood. Hollywood Defector. Yeah. So when you go to at Mrs. Escott sixty six, you'll see Hollywood Defector and a picture of me next to President Trump. Because I went to his Tucson rally on October 19th, and I got the best seat in the house over his right shoulder. So I was, like, the whole time he's on TV, I'm literally on the screen with him the whole time. And one of my friends got a screen cap, and that's my avatar. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so mainly I'm on Twitter just because of Q. So I'm one of General Flynn's digital soldiers. I've been in the battle the whole three years on the front lines every single day. Um and the main reason I got involved is because a lot of the things that they were talking about in the Q movement and the whole Pizzagate thing, I know to be true because I was there and I saw it. So people were trying to say it wasn't true and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, no, it's true. Take it from a former porn star who saw all this stuff, who interacted with these people. Um, I've seen it. It's true. And so I got recruited into the Q movement, and I've been out there red-pilling people ever since. Every day, like 12 hours a day, I'm on Twitter uh, with Q and on. That was the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria thing in Washington, right? Yes, okay, and it's one hundred percent true. Yes, I am familiar with that. Uh, if you fans, if you're not familiar, just look up Pizzagate. Um, you'll find all the information. Um, now, are you? Uh, what are you uh, for fans that want to see you? Do you participate in any of the like the adult conventions anymore, or any of the glow, or is that all just from your past now? No, I I leave all that stuff behind me. I mean, I'm more than willing to take questions on my Patreon. That's why I have it. So, um, and I'll send you the link for my Patreon, uh, my Patreon channel. It's $5 a month and you can interact with me, ask me questions. I've been posting a lot of my old glow pictures on there. I, um, I post my pictures and my documents from, you know, when I used to hang out with 
Chiss and Gene Simmons and Metallica and Jenna Jameson and, you know, Ron Jeremy, like all my old stories I'm putting up on there. Eventually I'll put up my video clips from my old TV show, my old interviews. I mean, I've got so much, I've got boxes and boxes of material. Um, I'm so, I'm having, a, I'm, I haven't had a whole lot of time to update it as much as I would like to lately because I'm so heavily involved with Q and we're right at the end of the operation. I'm expecting the arrest to start happening any moment now. So like as soon as we get past the inauguration, I'll have more time to uh, devote to it. But um, so if you go to my Twitter profile at the very top, hey, underneath, my, the underneath my, very rude. I'm in here trying to do an interview with my husband. <laughs> in the background so if you go to the top of my twitter profile under my uh avatar you'll see the link to my patreon and that's where if anybody you know it's you join it's five dollars a month um and it's kind of like I've, I've always meant to write a book about my life because i have so much material i mean i could go on and on and on and tell you about my interactions with everybody from billy idol to larry king to Polly shore to madonna i mean you know i've seen and done so much so i figured instead of writing a book which i keep saying i'm going to and i never get around to it patreon is really great because it's like a real life book i can go in there and i can write my stories and post my pictures but it's interactive people can ask me questions it's like interacting with the author of the book it's really neat i like it um so and it's you know it's five dollars a month and i'd actually have some people bitch and say well you know like in the QAnon movement they'll say well why are you charging five dollars a month you're a patriot p-a-y-t-r-i-o-t they call people in the QAnon movement that are making any kind of money at all they call you a patriot i'm like listen if i wrote a book would you expect a free copy of my book <laughs> yeah, exactly. would you be entitled to a, okay well so you're not entitled to, for me to sit down every day and to write this and to post this stuff that i've lived for the last 30 something years of my life how exactly are you entitled to my story and my time and my efforts please go ahead tell me explain when i interview people i have to buy their book i think out of 30 authors i've interviewed one of them's given me a book i mean <laughs> yeah yeah that you have to pay for it it's it's your oh, time I, and effort into it you it, deserve yeah, to be I mean, paid for it and trust me, I don't have that many subscribers. And you know what I do with the money, honestly, between you and I? I hand out $20 bills to homeless people on the street and give them hugs and take the time to get to know them and ask their name and ask their story. That's what I do with the money. Now, so I will include the link uh, in this interview for everyone out there listening if they want to you know, become join and become a member. And then I encourage everyone to follow you on Twitter. Are you on Instagram? I have an account on Instagram, but I'm never there. I'm never there. Um, I'll probably go and pull my pictures off. Um, I am. I have a TikTok account only so I can follow my daughter. I never put anything on there, but it's just so I can like watch my daughter put her silly videos up it's just to watch it. But the only place I'm active is Twitter, and that is it. You should start a podcast or a YouTube channel. You know, I thought about it. I I might do a private YouTube channel just for my Patreons so they can have live chats with me. I don't really know how to do it. Oh, I don't know how to do it, honestly. I could tell you that off the air. Okay. <laughs> More than happy to help. Well, I, my, I definitely... I'm sorry, but, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So my Patreon channel, it's, it's patreon.com forward slash Hollywood, but Hollywood is not spelled how you think it is. That's why I said you should probably just go to my Twitter profile and get the link there because it's spelled H and then a backwards three for the E and then L L Y. So Helly with the backwards three and then wood is W Q Q D. So yes, so, you, uh, want, you have my number. Yes. If you want to text it to me, I will definitely include it in the, uh, in the link though. Yeah, that'd be great. And then that's where people can, you know, talk to me because listen, I've got. So I was just going to say, well, I'll say two things. One, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. Um, out of your schedule to talk to us today. I really do appreciate that. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, not at all. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. You have been listening to the Chronicles of Hollywood History. Thank you from Gomez Richmond Productions.